On the docket tonight, a murder that uh, took place on a college campus out in California. Ted Rollins, Court TV anchor, has the story for us. All kinds of little certificates for him. Using her phone, Jennifer Kimberly shows off the wall she created in her son's bedroom with artwork and photos. Kirk Kimberly was just 18 when he was murdered in Northern California in 2016. The last time Jennifer saw her son was the morning of October 17th. He left on his bike to go meet a friend. I sent him a text around three o'clock asking him, just touching bases and he didn't respond. And then I sent him one at five o'clock and he didn't respond. And then when my husband came home, I told my husband I was worried because he didn't respond. The next day, flyers were posted asking for help to find Kirk, his bicycle, and a portable speaker he carried with him. We knew he could be identified to look for the bicycle and the speaker that, that I knew those were items that he had with him. Two and a half weeks later, Kirk's body was found in a shallow grave on the campus of Sonoma State University. It's located near a blackberry thicket. It is relatively difficult to get to that area if you're not looking for it. Johnny Kearns is a private investigator and author who wrote a book on this case, which for more than two years remained unsolved. It was a really tricky investigation. I interviewed over 50 people who were involved in Kirk's life, from ex-girlfriends to best friends to people he went to school with. And each of them had different pieces of the puzzle that they could give to me. And it really wasn't until about uh, six months before I completed the book where I had the ability to see the whole picture. In his book released last year, Kearns named 19-year-old Daniel Carrillo as a prime suspect. Carrillo was arrested and charged with Kirk's murder. He came to my house, I fed him lunch. He played video games with my son here. Carrillo was one of Kirk's friends. This is a photo of the two of them skateboarding with a group shortly before Kirk's murder. What's unclear is why Carrillo would kill his friend. This did not happen after a protracted fight. This happened quickly, and I believe Kirk was set up and didn't see it coming. Kirk's bike and speaker have never been found. Daniel Carrillo has pled not guilty. Investigators say cell phone evidence puts Carrillo at the scene of the murder. News that only adds to Jennifer's loss. I want him to know that it wasn't his choice. It, he didn't have a right to take someone else's life. I'm forever heartbroken. I'll never be the same. Kirk was, gave me purpose and meaning. He was my contribution to the world. And, and Kirk didn't get a second chance. I wish, I wish I could have saved him. So incredibly tragic for that mom. I mean, anytime you do one, a story where a parent has to bury a child and, and, and now they've got to go through this whole thing. It was a cold case. Now it's allegedly solved and now there's going to be a trial. It's not going to be easy for that mom. Not at all. It's just going to get tougher and tougher. Uh, but at the end, will she get some sense of justice? I don't know. It depends how this trial goes. Let's bring in our guest tonight, joining us from Beverly Hills, California, former federal prosecutor David Katz back with us. David, great to see you. Um, the question great why... To be with you, Vinny. Yeah. The question why has not really been made public. We don't know why. How important do you think that will be in a case like this where the defendant is a friend of the victim for you know, explaining to a jury why this happened? Well, you know, I've been uh, commenting on uh, Trump and Barr and everything, but people love a murder mystery. Uh, it's also a tragedy. Um, and that's one of the things that makes this case uh, difficult and fascinating. Uh, when I was a federal prosecutor, I prosecuted uh, someone charged with murdering the postal carrier. She was just on her rounds. She hadn't done anything wrong. And that seems to be the situation with this young man. And, uh, of course, our hearts go out. Um, to the victim and to the family, and uh, nobody, you know, can ever make it right. Uh, no one could ever make it right for the family that lost that uh, female postal carrier uh, back in my trial. You know, I convicted the defendant of first-degree murder. Uh, he went to federal prison for a long time, but, uh, you know, that's cold comfort to someone like this family who lost uh, what seems like a wonderful young man.
Now, in terms of the accused, this has so far happened in juvenile court. And as you know, Vinny, it's very difficult to get records out of juvenile court. Now that I'm a criminal defense attorney, I had a case about a year or two out here, uh, and my client was in a juvenile court. Um, and, you know, the whole record ends up getting sealed, you know, at the end. And unless you apply to the military or you apply to civilian law enforcement, uh, your record remains sealed, you know, basically for the rest of your life. Um, one of the problems, though, for the media and for the intense interest in a case like this is it's very hard to find out these nuggets of information. A few things have leaked. We know that the accused was already in juvenile custody. Uh, we assume for some kind of offense. I won't speculate, but there has been some speculation what that offense was. But, you know, the accused may have the defense in this case that uh, I didn't do it. I don't know what they're talking about. Supposedly, his cell phone records put him near the site. And as your report said, the site is somewhat remote, although it's near the college campus. Um, and, uh, and his defense may be that, uh, you know, when I last saw him, he was alive. We had a good time. We told a joke and, and I left. And whatever happened to him minutes or hours or whatever later, uh, I didn't do it. His defense may also be that it was some kind of a mutual combat situation, right, that they fought over something and that this really was self-defense. And of course, the body uh, was there for over two weeks before it was discovered. So it may be more difficult to fix the time of death, Vinny, or to figure out exactly, um, you know, what the um, what the wounds were, what the situation was. Were they consistent with a mutual combat situation? But they're saying that the autopsy has shown that there were multiple stab wounds in the victim. And if it were self-defense, you would think, okay, maybe you would stab the person once in self-defense, multiple stab wounds. That seems inconsistent with self-defense, but there's so much about this case uh, that we don't know. We don't know yet, but if and when it goes up to adult court and they open up some more of the information, of course, uh, we'll have that for you. We'll continue to track it. David Katz, joining us from Beverly Hills tonight. Thanks so much, sir. Appreciate it. Great to be with you, Vinny. All right, folks, uh, California versus Daniel Correa. We've got an arraignment on March 29th. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest there. In the meantime,